Perhaps the material is just too damn bleak. Maybe the runtime is too grueling for its own good. Or some strange artistic choices just make it tough to want to go back there. Whatever the reason, I am Gareth, this is What Culture, and here are 10 awesome recent movies you'll never watch again. Number 10, Bo is Afraid. Whether you loved or hated Ari Aster's unhinged horror comedy, Bo is Afraid, one thing's for sure, you will not forget it anytime soon. It's hardly surprising that Aster's bold artistic swing was a massive box office flop. Because a 179 minute nightmarish odyssey that literally feels like a three hour panic attack just isn't going to appeal to most people. And even accepting the brilliance of both Astor's uncompromising vision and Joaquin Phoenix's phenomenal performance, it's tough to persuade oneself to go through the whole thing again. One of the most common complaints about the film is that Bo's mid-film trek into the wilderness, where he stumbles across a travelling acting troupe, kills the story's pacing dead. It's by by far the most polarizing part of an already wildly divisive movie. And so, for many, they'll simply watch Bo is Afraid a single, solitary time, and then harbor a solid respect for it forevermore, while never once entertaining the possibility of sitting through it again. Number 9. Killers of the Flower Moon Martin Scorsese's towering epic crime thriller Killers of the Flower Moon is one of the most acclaimed films of the past year, scoring 10 Oscar nominations, while seeing Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, and Lily Gladstone turn in some of their finest performances to date. While Scorsese's films tend to be intensely rewatchable, though, Killers is a little different. Though there's plenty of unexpected gallows humour sewn throughout the film, it's also less flippant with its approach to violence, undeniably informed by its underreported historical context of the corrupt white political elite wishing to steal the wealth which the Osage nation sits on. The result is unsurprisingly grim, but what makes Killers a truly tough prospect to sit through again is that 206 minutes runtime. Even though that's a whopping three minutes shorter than Scorsese's previous film, The Irishman, its somewhat more sober, serious-minded approach, not that The Irishman was a chuckle fest by any means, makes it one you'll be hard-pressed to revisit. In the very least, it's an incredibly memorable experience, and so you'll likely never feel a major need to watch it again. But I want to know what is your favourite Scorsese movie of all time? Was it Killers or was it something else? You let me know in the comment section down below. Number 8. Saltburn Though Emerald Fennel's sophomore feature Saltburn posted only modest returns at the box office, it proved to be a strong word-of-mouth performer once it hit streaming, in large part due to many of the black comedy's more shocking moments going viral. Saltburn's audacious boundary-pushing script won't be for all tastes, and even for those who got a kick out of Fennel's class warfare satire, it's enough of a frenzied sit that a second viewing isn't necessarily that appealing. After all, this is a film where several bodily fluids are lovingly ingested and played with on screen. A number of people die horribly, and a man has sex with a grave of all things. Love or hate Saltburn, you won't forget it anytime soon. And so, unless you're especially keen to rewatch Barry Keoghan dancing around in the buff to Sophie Ellis Bexter's anthemic murder on the dance floor. A great scene, admittedly. This is likely a one and done affair. Number 7. Society of the Snow Society of the Snow is a brilliantly constructed dramatization of a 1972 plane crash, which left members of a Uruguayan rugby team stranded in the Andes, desperately fighting to survive. Though given a decidedly more Hollywood treatment with 1993's Alive, this new take cleaves away the gloss and focuses on a more immersive, factual retelling of the catastrophe. But for as meticulously detailed, visually jaw-dropping, and superbly acted as it is, Society of the Snow is also a harrowing, gut-wrenching sit for most of its 144 minutes. It, pulling no punches with its depiction of the instigating crash, an increasingly fraught survival scenario that follows. Even though the story is punctuated by some climactic hope, everything leading up to it is so tough to watch, especially the means the survivors resort to in order to stave off starvation, that you couldn't be blamed for vowing never to revisit it. Number 6. The Whale Darren Aronofsky typically isn't in the business of making fuzzy feel-good movies, and so it wasn't exactly a surprise that his adaptation of of Samuel D. Hunter's acclaimed play, The Whale, was one hell of a tough sit. Brendan Fraser won a well-earned Best Actor Oscar for his portrayal of a morbidly obese man who attempts to reconnect with his estranged daughter. And as transfixing as the work of Fraser and his co-stars is here, watching a dangerously overweight man continue down his self-destructive path for almost two hours makes The Whale a uniquely rough outing. Fraser's performance leaves enough of an impression that you likely won't feel the need to watch the film ever again. A 
especially combined with the common criticism that it feels like a filmed play, per the movie's extremely limited use of locations, and confined, some might say, uncinematic nature. That's without getting into the controversy surrounding its polarizing depiction of its embattled central character, which might additionally dissuade you from ever going back to it. Number 5. The Zone of Interest Jonathan Glazer's stunning Best Picture nominee, The Zone of Interest, is a grueling, exhausting film, which unfolds in the shadow of the Auschwitz concentration camp as a Nazi commandant and his family live in their dream home mere feet away. Despite featuring not a single on-screen death, Glazer's film ingeniously uses both pin-sharp sound design and precise visual framing to imply the horrific events taking place just out of view, ensuring it's no less traumatic a sit than a more outwardly explicit dramatization of the Holocaust. It's a film that leaves a nauseated, horrified feeling when it's over, and even though it's a relatively svelte 105 minutes in length, the audience is locked into Glazer's vice grip for the entirety. The zone of interest leaves a bruising impact on even the most hardened of viewers, and so few will ever likely decide to go back to it, no matter how expertly assembled it undeniably is. Number 4. The Killer David Fincher's The Killer is perhaps the filmmaker's most peculiar effort to date. A seemingly well-trod assassin botches a hit thriller, which is actually anything but. Fincher's latest film is positively awash in sarcasm from start to finish, depicting the travails of a hitman who claims to be the epitome of professionalism, and yet constantly proves himself to be quite the opposite. It's a resoundingly funny film, albeit one whose dark humour and subversion of the typical hitman movie are sly enough that general audiences likely found the killer a bit too devious for its own good. Less entertaining than utterly fascinating, the killer is directed with expectedly surgical precision by Fincher, but when you cross the familiar nuts and bolts of the setup, with an execution primed to turn off casual audiences looking for a basic assembly thriller, it's a little surprise that many conceded this to be one of the filmmaker's minor efforts. You'll likely glean everything you need to from a single viewing, and as great as Michael Fassbender is in it, the rewatch value simply isn't there compared to Fincher's bona fide classics like Seven, Fight Club, and The Social Network. Number 3. Anatomy of a Fall Unlike most movies on this list, the brilliant Anatomy of a Fall is neither too depressing nor too weird to merit a second viewing. It's simply that the experience is so expertly hinged around its central mystery that no repeat viewing can be quite the same. Now, of course, knowing the outcome of a mystery-laden story doesn't stop people from re-watching them, but given that Anatomy of a Fall never actually reveals whether Sandra killed her husband or not, that point isn't so much applicable. This 152-minute courtroom drama delves into such literally forensic detail of the focal incident that the viewer is likely to feel exhausted by the end, especially accepting the dramatic intensity of certain sequences, namely an unforgettable, brilliantly acted reconstruction of a volatile argument Sandra had with her husband. As such, the prospect of going back there isn't too appealing. No matter that Justine Trier's drama is absolutely one of 2023's best. Number 2. The Iron Claw The Iron Claw is one of the best films ever made about the world of professional wrestling, second perhaps only to Darren Aronofsky's The Wrestler, and like that film, it paints an extremely bleak picture of the industry's historic tendency to destroy lives. Sean Durkin's biographical drama depicts the legendary Von Erich wrestling dynasty from the late 1970s through to the early 1990s, chronicling the family's bevy of premature deaths, which led to them being deemed cursed. Though richly mounted by Durkin and brilliantly acted by its ensemble cast, best of all, a never better Zac Efron, seriously the guy kills it in this film, this is an almost unbearably devastating drama in which death is always around the corner. In fact, the real story in which five of the six Von Erich sons died before the age of 35 is so upsetting that Durkin decided to erase the youngest of the brothers, Chris, from the story entirely, feeling that his death at age 21 was one more tragedy that the film couldn't really withstand. As wonderfully crafted as the Iron Claw is from top to bottom, it takes a lot out of the viewer, and so all but the most die-hard wrestling fans will likely decide that one viewing is enough. Number 1. Women Talking Sarah Polly's Women Talking was one of 2022's most acclaimed films, a restrained, impeccably acted adaptation of Miriam Taves' novel of the same name. And even accepting that, like The Whale, it received criticism for feeling like a film stage play, that isn't the big reason why you'll likely feel no inclination to ever go back to it. This drama about a group of American 
and Mennonite women deciding whether to remain in their colony, following a series of horrific abuses by the community's men, makes one big aesthetic mistake which renders this otherwise absorbing film a bit of an eyesore to sit through. Upon release, Women Talking's washed-out colour grading was widely criticised, giving almost the entire movie an extremely flat, drab look. While this was obviously an intentional artistic choice by the director and her colourist, it makes an already staid, severe film even less appealing to return to, because it's so damn unpleasant to look at, sadly. What a shame.